Hello, this is the Provoke Prawn, and in this video I'm going to show you how to build an NZXT PC. That's inside the NZXT H9 Elite with the NZXT Kraken Z73 and an NZXT motherboard and power supply unit. So all the things as well as a number of other specs that I'll obviously leave in the description alongside a Zotac 4080 with a vertical mount, which is an optional purchase, that ends up looking like this, which is pretty swish. So here I'm going to start off by showing you what the case is all about and the sort of logic of it and the features of it. And then I'm going to go into these various different steps for creating this build or recreating it. If you want to do something similar, I'm going to detail everything you need to know every single step of the way, including installing a RAM, CPU and more. So there's going to be a lot of guidance here and all the various things from multiple angles that will hopefully make it a lot easier for you. So stick with me right to the end to find out all you need to know. Now the H9 Elite is actually one of the nicest cases that I've built in and one of the easiest to build in. It's really roomy thanks to this dual chamber design and a setup that allows you to run cables through it really easily. As you can see, you can also install your fans and other things in a variety of ways. So it gives you some options in terms of layout because you have options in terms of 360 mil radiator mounting. For example, I'm gonna mount mine on the side, but you can also top mount it. So you have a variety of options there. It also comes with four fans as standard. So you get three 120 mil RGB fans that you can see side mounted on the back of the case to start with, and then one single non-RGB fan on the rear. So it's pretty good setup there immediately. Mm -hmm. A lot of the panels are also removable, including that top one, which you can see you can pop off with relative ease. And you'll see the power buttons, two USB ports, USB-C up there as well. So you have easy access to those. And there's a lot of venting. You'll have seen on the rear of the case, there's a lot of air vent holes. There's also a lot of dust covers with a similar sort of logic. So you can see here that on the top, there's a little removable dust tray and there's also one on the bottom of the case and on the rear that I'll show you in a second. Each of these panels is held in place with thumb screws and clips and it just requires a bit of tugging and lifting, for example, to get this side panel off so that you get access to the inside. And obviously take care while doing that because it will break if you're not careful. And on the top is an interesting design with a plastic tray which you can remove to install your fans on. Now again, you can mount a 360 mil radiator up here if you want to. So if you're using an all-in-one cooler, this is an option to mount up here, but you can take that out. You see it's just held in place with two thumb screws and then some clips on either end and you just need to pull that out. And then you've got lots of space to be able to reach inside and build things. So it makes sense to take all these things off. The rear panel also pops off as well. And you'll see a huge dust trap in the back of that that's also removable. So there's plenty of airflow potential here with air obviously being able to travel through the back with relative ease. So it's worth making use of those intake fans as they're set up or experimenting with other designs as I'm going to because I've actually realized once you take that off, there's a hell of a lot of room back here. It's a very spacious design, which is great for both installing the power supply unit, running your cables and other things. There's a HDD cage here. So for your hard disk drives, if you're gonna be using Plata hard drives, you can obviously optionally install that and use it. I'm not for this build, but I will show you where to put it. And then you also have an SSD tray, which runs down the middle, which is again, removable. And that's held in place with screws and clips. And I'll show you the process for taking that off in a minute. So you have options for installing multiple drives in there. On the underside, that dust cover comes off and I would recommend doing that for when you go about the installation of the fans. Just don't forget to put it back on. Now at the front, you'll have noticed this large cardboard box. If you take that out, there's find another tray inside it. This is for the top. So you can see this is a slightly different design. This allows you to install two fans instead of three, and you can have a 280 mil radiator at the top if you want to do something smaller. I personally don't see the logic of this, but if you want to, you can swap that out for the standard one that's included. Use that instead, so it gives you some options. Now I'll leave all the specs of the case in the description so you can find out more about the logic of what you can do, what fans you can install and where. So be sure to check that out if you want to find out more about it. But this is the general process for setting it up and the sort of logic behind it. So this SSD tray that I was talking about a minute ago is held in place with a couple of screws 
at the top and the bottom. Remove those and then you can lift it up and it has on a hinge, which is pretty nice. So it's hinged design there that allows you to just move it out of the way when you need to. But you can also pull it out entirely through those clips so it will just tug out. And I'd recommend doing that and get it out of the way. And I'll show you how to mount an SSD on that later on. I also popped those screws back that were holding it in place to make sure I didn't lose them. Nice little simple tip there. Then there's obviously the front panel connections, which are all bundled up in that little bag. This gives you that top USB-A, USB-C connections, as well as the HD audio for 3.5 mil, front panel connection and other things. And this is all bundled up together, but I'll show you the step for installing it. So that's the USB-A. Then you have a USB 2.0 header, which is an internal header that comes from the fan control. I'll show you in a minute. The front panel connection, which is for your power button. And that installs in the bottom right of the motherboard. But again, I'll show you this all later on where it plugs in. HD audio, which also plugs into the motherboard. And that's for the 3.5 mil connection. So if you want to plug in a headset to the case, you can do that. And then the USB-C connection. And I'll show you the steps for all of these things later. So stick with me there. Now, this case comes bundled with the NZXT fan controller. This is a new version of the fan controller designed to work with these duo fans that are included with the case, so the RGB fans. And this allows you to control up to nine fans. It has a cable on a couple of those ports that you can see, which has the option to plug in three fans into a single connection, but it also controls RGB lighting. Now I'm taking it out for the purposes of my build just because I wanted to be able to demonstrate how to use it. You do not need to take it out when you're on your build process but this will give you a closer view of what's happening. You can see the fans are plugged in as standard, so you'll see that the power and RGB for them is connected up. If you take it out and have a look, you'll see that it has six RGB hubs on it, so six RGB ports, and then three fan power ports as well. But as I said, you can power up to nine of those duo fans on it, and you can plug those in with those adapters. Now, it just has two connections, one USB, and one SATA power, the USB goes to the bottom of your motherboard, the SATA power connects your power supply, and I'll show you that later on. Now, when I went about this process, I realized that this tray is removable, and so are the fans, naturally. It's held in place with two thumb screws at the top and then one at the bottom. What I did notice here, though, which is interesting, is that there's a lot of room on this fan tray, which gives you the option to potentially do other things. Now, these fans are set as intake as standard, so they will pull air from the rear of the case through all those vented holes into your case. It's actually not a bad setup. You could probably just leave it like that. But for demonstrating just what's possible with this case, I thought it'd be nice to take these fans off and to show you the differences and how you could set it up and one potential way to do it because it's a very roomy case and easy to build in. Now, I've done a video separately on the wiring logic of these fans, how they work, the best ways to install them, and how to wire both single, triple, and multiple fans, as well as setting it up with various different all-in-one coolers. I'll link to that video in the description so you can find out more. And I'm gonna show you some of the steps here, obviously for this case, but if you want to add in a lot more fans, then you have the option. Now, as I said, I'm using the NZXT Kraken Z73. This is the RGB version, which actually comes with its own RGB fans as standard, but we're not going to be using those here because we actually have more of the same fans that are included in the case. So the F120 RGB Duo fans, NZXT was kind enough to send all this stuff over so I can show you what's what and how to set it up. These fans with the triple pack of F120s come with an RGB controller that allows you to plug in the RGB lighting. You can then plug in the power directly to your motherboard, but you don't need that controller in this instance, or you most likely don't, depending on how many fans you're installing, because as I said, you can use the included fan controller that comes with the case here. But you can see that if you have the F140s, which is the 140 mil fans on the left, and the F120s, you can use two RGB controllers if you want, and then you can control the power separately from your motherboard instead. So if you don't have that controller, let's say you're using the H9 Flow, for example, or a different NZXT case, then you have the option to plug in the RGB to those control boxes and the fan power to your motherboard. So these are obviously different looking fans to the ones that are included with the cooler, but don't worry, you can still use them. The setup is slightly different though. Now I've done a video separately on how to install the Z73 RGB, 
and I went into a lot of depth on all the various steps of it. So if you're going to install a standard setup, be sure to check out that, and I'll link to that in the description. But essentially what we're doing is we're just going to swap out the standard fans for these other ones. Now it's worth noting those standard ones are daisy chain, whereas these new duo fans are not. They have two cables on them, whereas previously the steps basically required you to wire one fan to another, to another, and then to the pump head for the RGB lighting. This time we're actually going to be connecting them up in a more logical way. Now, interesting point here, don't necessarily follow this step that I'm doing, but this is how you would mount the fans if you want to top mount the radiator. So if you're mounting it on top of the case, we're setting these fans to exhaust. So they're set face down into the case that will then pull air from the case up through the radiator and out the top of the case. This will then cool, obviously, the coolant inside, the all-in-one cooler, and then hopefully keep your CPU nice and cool as well. And this is one option, and this is how I set it up initially before I realized what you can do with the fan tray in the case. So I wanted to show you the various steps for doing it. So this is one option. You could install one like this and then top mount the radiator and set it up that way. So basically use the long screws that are included with the all-in-one cooler to screw these fans into the radiator. You then need to connect up the RGB connection to either the RGB controller or to the fan controller that's already in the case. So the RGB from the fans obviously runs to the back of the case for neatness and then plugs in there. Now with the pump, you get this cable that plugs into the pump header that then has a breakout cable on it with three fan connections. So you could connect up the power cables from those fans to this. This then gives the system control over the fans and the pump together. So basically the whole thing is all in one setup so that the fans are controlled by this. This is the best way of doing it rather than connecting the fans to the fan controller in the case because it ensures that the whole system sort of closed system has control over both the speed of the pump and the speed of the fans to ensure good cooling on it as well. Now once I got that fan tray out I realized how deep it was and also how deep the back of the case is in terms of the setup of that dual chamber design. So actually what I decided to do was to change things up. And this is what I was talking about because I wanted to show you that it's possible to do things in a different way. If you look at the fan tray, you'll see that there are slots on it that allow you to obviously install fans as it has done, but also there's enough space to essentially mount the radiator to the back of the tray so that it will be hidden away at the back of the case, but the tubes from it will then run through to the front. I think this is a great option in terms of the installation because it adds a bit of stealth aesthetic to it because that radiator is hidden away and it gives you more space at the front which hopefully encourages better airflow and also looks nicer but more importantly i just wanted to demonstrate that you can do this so this case is really flexible in terms of the options for installation so the logic is very similar basically what i'm doing here is that I'm setting the fans up to pass the screws through the fans and into the radiator basically by going through the fan tray first. These screws are long enough to do that so the radiator fan screws will pass through both things and hold it in place. Now I have swapped the fans around though you will notice that they're facing the other way. Logic here is instead of exhausting through the radiator I'm going to be intaking through so the setup here is in putting the fans with their back facing into the case. So it'll be sucking cold air from the rear of the case through the radiator and then through the fans and into the case. I'm also going to set the bottom fans in the case to intake as well. So you have that. Now, here's a point of interest as well. Another thing that I noticed is this tray is deep on the other side. Even with the radiator mounted on it, there's still plenty of room. This gives you the option to do a push-pull setup where you get some additional fans and ideally use the same ones, so another set of F120 Duo fans, and you can put them on the other side. Because you can see, even with the radiator set up on the rear of this fan tray, at the back of the case is absolutely loads of room still. It's really deep, so you have plenty of space to then put those extra fans on there and still be able to put the door on. And that's interesting. Now, basically, these fans are set up with the same logic as the ones on the front. So two lots of fans pulling air through the radiator that should keep things really cool. I'm not doing it in this case because I don't actually have enough fans to do it, but that is an option if you want to consider it. Now, once the radiator's in place, obviously we need to connect up the RGB from those fans. So run the RGB from those fans that are on the radiator through to the controller. The fan power, as I noted, 
goes into the pump head, and I'll show you that connection again later on. But the RGB goes in here. Now I did make sure to re-plug in that single rear fan power that comes from the rear of the case. Now again, this is the hard disk drive tray. This is an optional thing, so if you're not using platter hard drives, you don't need to worry about it, you can just take it out. But it slots into the back of the case and has a thumb screw that holds it in place. Now sadly, I don't have a spare hard disk drive to be able to show you the setup process for that, but there are options in the manual on how to do it. Essentially, you stall that in there, and then you need a SATA power and data connections. Very similar to the SSDs, though, so stick around for the guide on how to do that. Now, for this build, I'm using NZXT motherboard, N7Z790 motherboard. I've got 64 gigabytes of Kingston Fury Beast RAM, although I actually end up only using two. More on that later on. And I'm using the Corsair MP600GS NVMe SSD, as well as the WD Black SN850. Now... You can see that you have removable trays on this. I'm going to do a video separately on this motherboard. And then you can install your NVMe drives. It actually has space for multiple NVMe's. So I'm using this two terabyte MP600, potentially for games and you know, for video files. It's a Gen 4 drive. So it gets up to 5,000 megabytes read speed. It's pretty nifty and easy to install as well. But I'm using WD Black Drive for my main Windows boot drive. So I'm installing that on the top spot. This already has windows on it, so it just makes the process for setting it up a lot easier. But these drives are really easy to install. You can see they just slot into place. Now on this motherboard, you actually take the thermal sticker off this pad. So there's a thermal pad underneath, and then you put that tray back on top of it and screw it down. Make sure you get it the right way around because I put it on the wrong way around there. And that goes over the top to keep it sort of cool and allow the heat transfer. And then that is then screwed down over that. That then secures the NVMe SSD into place, which is an interesting design because usually you require an additional M2 screw, which is included in the motherboard box that allows you to screw these down. So here you can see the normal installation. This is the Corsair MP600. So you just hold that down and then you use the tiny little screw to screw it down into that standoff. I'd actually recommend using multiple NVMe drives because it gives you the option to install different things on there. So for example, you could put your games on one of these drives and Windows on the other. And that allows you fast boot times, but also ensures that you get quick loading with your games. Or if you're transferring video files like I am around, they really make a big difference. And they're a lot easier to install than other things. Now, this is a 13th gen motherboard, which obviously means it will work with Intel's new lineup of 13th gen CPUs. But I'm actually using a 12th gen as well, so that gives you the option. This is Core i9 12900K simply because I had it spare and it was the easiest thing to do. The installation for that is pretty simple. There's a little gold arrow that points down into the bottom left corner. You push that down into there, lower that catch down and then pop off the top. Now for the RAM installation, you need to make sure you install it in slots A2 and B2. So that's the second slot in and then the fourth slot in. So you need two sticks as a minimum set into these two spots. Otherwise, it won't boot and it will be problematic. I also had problems when I installed four slots of RAM in here. And so it's worth keeping that in mind that some motherboards will have problems with four sticks of DDR5. XMP can cause issues, but also it's just even sometimes booting might be a problem. So if you do have an issue, just take those two out. But make sure you populate A2 and B2 first. The next stage of this is to prepare the cooler setup. So we've got the back plate here, which goes through. This is an LGA 1700 setup. And so we need to make sure the notches for the standoffs are in the far corners and they poke through. So on that back plate, just push them out to the sides and they poke through the front. And then you have a little bag of standoffs that's clearly marked Intel 1700. So this is LGA 1700 socket. If you've just purchased the Kraken Z73. The standoffs will come included with this. They're different to the previous models. And again, I've done a detailed guide on this cooler and the installation process. That I'll link to in the description if you want to find out more about the specifics. But basically you need to put that back plate through and then install the standoffs in all four corners, making sure it's nice and tight. We're prepping the motherboard now because it's a lot easier than when it's installed in the case. Makes life a little bit more straightforward. Now for this build, I'm using NZXT C1200 Gold. 
This is obviously a hefty power supply unit. It's an ATX 3.0 one though as well. So this has some interesting highlights if you're using a 40 series GPU because it gives you an additional cable for that 600 watt power a single connection to that graphics card. It also has the power to power a lot of things. I'm going to do a video separately on the wiring of this PSU and the logic, but I'm going to show you here what cables you need for the build that I'm doing and how to do it and where they plug in. So this should make life a lot more straightforward for you, hopefully. But you can see included in the box, you get quite a few different power cables, nice thick braided ones. And that's a modular power supply unit. So you just need to plug in things where you need to connect them up. So you only need to plug in what you actually want to use. And we're going to start with the most important ones, which is the 24 pin power connection for the motherboard. So you can see this is one fat connection that is split into two on one end. And so connect up those two on the power supply unit here and make sure everything's seated properly. So make sure you push it all the way in until it clips into place. I'd recommend setting these cables up before you install the power supply. It just makes life a lot easier in terms of making sure everything is plugged in. But I'm going to quickly show you where they plug in in theory, just so you can see that. So the 24 pin will plug in on the right hand side here on your motherboard and that clicks into place. Again, you need to make sure that that's pushed all the way in and that the clip goes in so it will hold it down and that the power will pass through properly. I'm doing this all outside the case. Don't connect these cables up to your motherboard just yet. I'll show you how to do it when it's in the case as well, uh, just for demonstration purposes so it's easy to see. That's where the 24 pin goes in once you finish that. Just below that is the USB-C connection as well, so watch out for that and I'll show you what to do with that at the end. We then need two CPU cables, so you can see these cables are clearly marked CPU on one end of them, and on the power supply you'll also see markings for CPU and PCIe connections. So in the top right, we'll plug in two of these 8-pin power supplies for the CPU. So this again plugs into the motherboard, connects up to the motherboard and this gives you power for things like overclocking but also just important to install all of these cables for the motherboard connection. So these connect up in the top left. You can see that there's one 8 pin and one 4 pin. So once it's in the case you'd run these cables through and plug them in and that top left connection there one single one goes in there and then the other one splits in half so this 8 pin breaks apart and then you can just plug that in to the other connector. A fairly straightforward setup process and, and once again make sure you do this when it's in the case and I'll show you the steps for it later so it's really straightforward and easy to do but I wanted to show you every step in the easiest way possible. Next is the flat SATA power connector. So you can see this is daisy chainable, so you can connect up multiples. This connects up to the peripheral and SATA connections that you can see on the bottom here. So plug that in and then you can plug in the other end. Now this cable is used for all sorts of things, including RGB controllers, fan controllers, SSDs and hard disk drives. Depending on how many drives you're installing or how many controllers you're installing, you might need multiples of these cables, so just keep that in mind. For this build, I'm using one Kingston SSD. This is a 2.5 inch SSD, and you'll see that the connection goes in like that. So on one end, it goes into the power supply unit. On the other end, it goes into the SSD. This is also used for things like the NZXT fan controller that I showed you earlier on. So you can see that that has a flat connection on it that comes out of it. That needs to be plugged in there. So once all the fans are connected up, this cable then gives power to that controller to ensure that it can power all those different fans. And you can plug it in here, either with the daisy chain cable or with a separate connection. So you have that option. Next is the PCIe connections. Now this is going to vary depending on what graphics card you're using. So I'm going to give you a demonstration of two different ones just to make life easier. So this is a PCIe connection. So it goes in these PCIe connectors. I'd use the bottom ones below the CPU ones that we used earlier on. If you're using an NVIDIA or AMD GPU that isn't the 40 series, so the older generation, then you might well need a cable like this. And you can see that it's split into two. So here's a Gigabyte RTX 3090. This is my usual graphics card. And that has two 8-pin power connections on it. Now you might have three on yours, which means you'll need two cables. And then you basically need to install these cables by pinching them together, making sure all the connectors together and then just push them into place. This is a little bit fiddly, and again, you need to make sure you push it all the way in so that those clips go in. And again, 
this is outside the case, not inside. So you'd actually wait till you've got the graphics card installed before you put these cables in, but it just shows you how to do it. You'll notice they split apart, so it actually has six pin on it. Some graphics cards actually have six pin power connectors, and that's why that logic's there. You can see that I'm using it in this daisy chain setup, but you could use two separate power cables if you wanted to. You have the option. Now, if you're using a 40 series from NVIDIA, you also have this included 600 watt power cable. So that plugs in down the bottom right or a single connection there. You can't actually plug the wrong cable into this because it's a different design. This replaces those two cables that you saw a minute ago and puts them into a single connection. And that's used for the RTX 4080 from Zotac that you saw earlier on. So I'll show you how to connect that up. A bit later on again make sure all the cables that you need are plugged in before you install the power supply unit it makes it a lot easier because you can see what plugs in where and it just makes it a bit more straightforward than having to sort of bend your head around and plug things into it when it's installed in the case so a lot more straightforward so in the next stage i'm going to install the motherboard because we've already readied this and the standoffs for it are already pre-installed, so you basically just need to slot it into place by pushing it into the back so that the I.O. pushes through the back panel, and then obviously we need to screw it down. Now, this little box that was included at the bottom of the case at the rear has a number of different screws in it, as well as some cable ties if you need them. And these are neatly included in a variety of bags with their own labeling. So this includes all sorts of things like power supply, unit installation, screws and more. And you can see there's a long list here on the manual to tell you which ones are used for which. In this instance, we're using the six by 32 by five millimeter screws to screw the motherboard down. You need eight screws approximately because you've got three along the top, three along the bottom, and then two more in the middle, because we don't have a standoff in the middle as a metal prong that basically goes through the hole there. So screw that down and make sure that's nice and secure. You can see from this view just how much space there is still. Admittedly, I don't have any fans installed on the top or the bottom just yet, but there's loads of space there. It's also worth noting you can remove the cable tray if you need to. So the next stage is working out sort of the logic of where the pump's going to sit. You can see that there's not much room between the pump tubing and the RAM. You can actually install it so the tubes are down instead. And I've done this in previous builds, so they're down at the bottom, and then you can adjust the display on this cooler in the software. But there is enough room to be able to install it with this RAM in this direction. And that is the standard installation. It's also the neatest because it ensures the cables coming out of the pump run straight to the top but you can see sort of how flat these cables are going to run. And I actually find this is going to be the best setup for this. And it actually looks really nice. You can also see just how sort of invisible the radiator is because it's tucked away at the rear. So I think this is actually working out to be a nice setup in this direction. But again, you could have top mounted this radiator and then you just need to sort of work out which way around the pump's going to sit. You can actually choose any of the sort of directions and orientations because you can adjust it in the software so work out what's best for your sort of setup and it'll still work perfectly fine so this pump already has thermal paste pre-applied so we don't need to worry about thermal paste you just need to seat it down over the top remembering to remove that plastic cover that protects it beforehand because otherwise it won't be cooling your cpu as it should so sit that down over the standoff screws that we previously installed and then you just need to secure the thumb screws on top so each of the four corners is a thumb screw that goes down on there and holds it in place basically make sure that this is nice and tight without over tightening it so don't use too much force but one of the biggest causes that i found of cpus running too hot is that this isn't done properly so if you haven't secured this properly you may find your cpus running a bit too hot i've done a video separately on how to check this sort of thing and i'll link to that in the description but essentially just even doing something as basic as making sure these are nice and secure will ensure good cooling on your CPU, which obviously will ensure better performance. So we can now see we're getting into this installation. We're getting quite far into it, but we're just using the screwdriver quickly to then screw those down. Just be very gentle, though, once that process is done. 
And again, then you've got the breakout cable that runs through to the rear. This is those three fan connections that I mentioned earlier on, so that, don't forget to plug those in at the rear. That gives you the power for the fans. It also has a flat SATA connector, so the power that comes from the power supply unit that I showed you earlier on. And then also there's an RGB connection, which we won't need in this instance because we won't be using it. You also have a USB connector, which you do need. And I'll show you that in a second. But we can push those fan cables up and the other cables and run them through to the rear. You could also use a cable tie at this point if you wanted to tidy these black cables up and make them a bit neater. Just run those to the back and then cable tie them together because they are a little bit messy, but running them through to the back makes life a bit neater. And by the end, you can barely see them because they're hidden away by most of the things as in the build as well. So it actually turns out looking pretty good. Now the pump has a cable that connects up to the AIO pump header, which you can see here. Make sure you connect that up as well. So coming out of that pump head is that an important cable that plugs in there. You also have a USB connection. So micro USB connection that plugs in the top left if you've done it in this orientation. That runs through to the back of the case, then down to the bottom and plugs in in the middle and the USB connection at the bottom. This gives you control over the pump head display via the NZXT software and also feeds through that information to make sure you actually have everything running as it should be. See on this motherboard, there's two USB connections in the middle at the bottom, so you can run that through and connect it up there. Now you may well find, depending on what else you're installing, that you're gonna fill these up quite quickly because obviously the fan controller also requires a USB connection. So that's both of those filled up. And if you're using anything else, you might need to buy a splitter and it is possible to get USB splitters. So I'll leave details on that in the description as well. The power supply unit mounts in this way. Make sure you may mount it facing this way so the fan is facing towards the back of the case because that sucks cold air in from the rear and then blows hot air out of the back. So basically this ensures good airflow for the power supply unit. You then have four screws included with the PSU or with those motherboard screws that you saw earlier on that secure into the four corners at the rear. You can see there's a little tray for where the power supply unit will sit as well. We then need to run those cables through that I showed you earlier on. So the CPU fan cables obviously run up to the top rear and plug in on the motherboard and I'll show you that later on. And once again, don't forget to plug in the radiator fans. So those fans that we installed on the radiator, the power plugs into the breakout cables that came from the pump header. So run those through and connect them up. Now, one thing I've noticed, I'm not gonna be doing much cable tidying back here because I am gonna be removing a lot of the stuff and changing the build in this case in the next couple of weeks, just for demonstration purposes. But you can see, just how much space there is, even with all these cables already put into place, there's loads of room back here. So it's great for cable management. And there's lots of different Velcro ties and channels and lots of space to run things. And we run that fat 24 pin power supply cable through to the front and then manipulate it into place. You can see that there's a cable tray here, which is making life a little bit difficult. You can actually remove that cable tray on the right hand side, but it does hide things away quite nicely. So you can see a lot of what's going on at the rear is hidden, but even that cable that's running through and plugging in there is hidden away as well. Don't forget to once again plug in the CPU power connectors that we ran up to the top as well. And then you can tidy them up because there's various different Velcro straps along the top that you can obviously use to hide things away, to neaten them up or to just hold them into place. So you can see me speeding up this process a little bit. We can tie down a lot of those cables and set them up so that they're mostly tidied away. Don't forget to connect up the SATA power connections for the pump head and for that fan controller to the power supply unit to make sure that they're both getting the power they need. Otherwise you will run into problems. So those connections are already there. Next, we're going to sort out these front panel connections. So this is what I showed you earlier on. That blue one is the USB connection. So it's a standard USB-A connector. And then this is the USB-C. We'd run them through sort of roughly in the same place where the 24 pin runs through. So you can see this is the USB-C connection that plugs in just below the 24 pin. So it's easy to run it in through there and then connect that up. And then the USB-A is ever so slightly different because that's a bit further down and this is sort of sideways. So it's mostly hidden. It was quite fiddly to do because of the cable tray, but you can push it in from this angle. Now, some other motherboards have it facing down. So you have to pull that cable up go over the top and then push it down like we just did with the USB-C connection. 
but this one it's sort of sideways mounted into it so it's a little bit fiddly to do but basically just thread that through and push it in there and then don't forget we have the other connections so we've got the usb connection for the fan controller and for the pump and then we've got the hd audio connection which you can see on my left hand that's 3.5 mil from the top of the case it allows you to plug in a 3.5 mil headset if you want to or headphones and that connects up in the bottom left of the motherboard so i'm going through all these steps again just to make sure that you know where things plug in and make sure everything's connected up as it should be so a close look at that you can see front audio notice that there's one pin missing on this connection so you can't actually get it the wrong way around because the cable and the pins are actually missing in the same place as the hole missing makes life a little bit easier on the bottom right is the f panel which is the front panel this is for your power button so this is really important and you can see that on the bottom right there next to the power and reset buttons run that through and plug it in and then you have that set up and then again usb connection for the pump and for the fan controller so we're basically most of the way there now with that set up which is pretty nice so now we're going to install the rest of the fans now i've got those two 140 mil duo fans I'm going to pop those onto the bottom of the case here and this will be set up so that they're intake so they're face down towards the bottom of the case again make sure you take the dust tray off this will give you access to that you then need to use the little fan screws that are included with the fans themselves to screw that into the case so you screw them in from below and set those up now these are set up so that they intake air so they pull cold air in from below and blow it up towards your graphics card and obviously across the motherboard the logic here is i'm pulling cold air in from below and also through the radiator on the cooler and then i'm exhausting hot air out of the top with that rear fan and the top fans that you'll see me install in a second i've done a video separately on the logic of fan setup and how you should do it and things to avoid hopefully that will be useful if you're not too sure but just follow the same process as me because hot air rises so basically you want to install your fans in a logic that helps with that you need to then obviously run those fan cables to the rear and plug them in so that you have the fan power connection and the RGB connection on here. Now it's worth noting that if you are installing a lot of fans, obviously I said you can only install six RGB connections and nine fan power connections to this controller. You can obviously also make use of the NZXT RGB connectors and the system fan headers on your motherboard to install more so if you want to add in more fans than i am then you have the potential to do that whether you're looking at push pull for your radiator or you want to install more rgb fans or you know if we could have three f120 fans instead of two f120s on the bottom for example you could also swap out the standard non-rgb fan that's included on the rear you could put an rgb f120 fan on the rear instead and then you just obviously need to run those through to the controller or to your motherboard to set up the power for those things as well so there's some logic to how to do that and again i've shown a lot of that sort of setup logic in the fan video particularly on those fans which should demystify some of that complexity but again, you can see, despite the fact that we've got a lot of cables running back here now, there's still plenty of room. So you can see a top view of those bottom mounted fans. Obviously, a large 140 mil, so potentially they spin a little slower, but still pull in quite a lot of air. But you do have the option of 120 instead if you want to do that instead of 140. Now, for the tops, I'm using again 120 mil duo fans. And then this is that fan tray that I showed you at the beginning that I took out right at the beginning. And again, I'm mounting these so that they're face down into the case and we're screwing the fan screws in from above. So what will be the top of the case is where the screws are going in. So you put the screws in that come included with the case. There's also some in the fan box. So whether you bought the fan separately or whether you're using the screws that are included with the case, you can do that. So basically, you just need to secure each of them. They've got four screws each. But the logic is the same here, as I said already. Face down into the case, so that's pulling the hot air that we put in. So obviously, the CPU, the RAM, the motherboard, and the graphics card are all going to be producing heat, which we need to exhaust out of the case to keep it running nice and cool. So we're setting these up this way. And you could potentially have mounted the radiator to this instead. So you could top mount the radiator with the same logic, though. Set those top fans so that they basically pull air through the radiator. I 
like do as I did earlier on. So basically set them on one side so they're pulling air through to the top. And the nice thing about this tray is once it's obviously set up, you can just put it back in the way you took it out. So it pushes back in with those clips on either end and then the thumb screws. And the cables will actually run through the back through that hole with relative ease as well. And that's the nice thing I found about this case is it's really easy to build in the cable management, so straightforward and everything's nicely hidden out of view. You can see that getting the tray back in is a little bit fiddly because you have to push things down over those clips, but then those cables will just run into the rear in a really straightforward way. So obviously we need to make sure this tray is secured. So you use those thumb screws at the top, just tighten those up, make sure they're nice and tight so it's now secured in place. So we've now got a lot of the fans installed and set up and ready to go. Obviously we need to wire those up. So we'd run the power connections and the RGB connector down to the fan controller at the bottom. We've got a lot more cable mess going on back here, but you could use the plastic cable ties to tidy those up or the Velcro ties that you've seen throughout the case. And you also notice that I'm running a couple of these power cables through to the front because I've actually run out of ports on here now with all the different fans that are installed because obviously there's a lot of RGB connections. So I just ran that through and plugged it into the NZXT RGB header on the motherboard and the system fan header. Now you do obviously have the option of using the RGB controller that I showed you that comes with the fans instead. You can do that. However, one thing I've noticed is that it does need a USB connection to your motherboard. So you will need a USB splitter, whether that's a Y splitter or an alternative. So those are potentially extra problems because if you use those controllers, you then have too many USB connections. So this is a good alternative. Just plus it, plug it into the system fan header with the power and then the NZXT RGB connectors on the motherboard there and you then have the necessary power and RGB for that. And those fans will still be controllable via the NZXT cam software. Now I'm just plugging in the power to check things are working as they should be. And then obviously press that button on top. You can see all the fans that should light up do. But one thing of note is the ones on the radiator aren't spinning. Uh, so this is worth doing before you finish up before your cable tie because I realized these weren't spinning. And the reason for that was actually the pump head connections were a little bit loose. So I needed to just push those in a bit further and I sorted that out. But it's worth doing that to check that everything's running as it should be. Now I want to show you the installation of the SSD. You can you see it uses M3 X5 millimeter screws. Again, that was included with the case and that little cardboard box. And there are multiple mounting points for multiple SSDs on this tray. So the process basically it sees you installing the SSD on the inside of the tray where it'll be hidden away at the back of the case. And you basically just slide it into there and then screw it down. I do think you have the option to install it in either direction, which is an interesting point. As long as the screw holes are facing to the rear, you can choose which way the cables are going to run. This then has those four screws that you then screw down to hold that SSD in place. So we screw that down and then obviously we'll go through the process of popping the cables in. This is the data connection for the SSD. It'll be the same connector for hard disk drives if you're using that. Plugs in there and don't forget that SATA power connection I showed you earlier on. So that fat connector that we plugged in the power supply unit, that pops in here as well. That gives you the power and the data connection. So the data goes to the motherboard and the power goes to the power supply unit. And you can see where the data connection is on the motherboard here. It's right next to the front panel USB-A connector. So it just slots in and pops in there. Obviously, once everything's installed in the case, run those cables through to the front and connect them up nice and straightforward. Now you can then pop the SSD tray back in. Don't forget, it has those clips at the top and bottom, clips into place, and then just slots down. And we can secure those power cables and data cables and plug them all in and then sort everything out. Now, obviously don't forget, make sure all your cables are plugged in nicely so that you have them plugged in both ends of the power supply unit, but also that the, all the SATA connections are done. So for your pump head, for the fan controller, for your SSDs and hard disk drives, make sure they're all connected up, all the cables are in place properly as they should be. And then just need to re-secure that SSD tray. Don't forget to screw it down with those two screws that are included and then it's secured into place. Note, once you've done that though, that you then can't access all the cables for cable tidying or making sure everything's running as it should be. Peel the little sticker off and then a, another test run. You can see the fans are spinning properly this time. All the fans are spinning as they should be. I do wish I had an RGB fan for the rear 
So bear that in mind that you could do that instead and it would look a lot nicer, I think. It's just miss- it looks like it's missing something, but sadly I didn't have quite enough fans to fill that up. And then we can obviously just put everything back together. Now, obviously I haven't done the graphics card, but I wanted to demonstrate the basis of this first before we get to the GPU, because I'm going to show you how to mount the GPU in both a standard orientation and in a vertical mount as well. So we have a nice looking case, sort of looks pretty empty. Good news about this case is it's pretty huge as well. So I'm using an RTX 4080 from Zotac, which is pretty chunky as you'll see, and obviously quite lengthy as well. So if you're curious about the overall size of this case and what it can take, you'll be pleased to see that it will take the 40 series relatively easily. This is a three slot card though, so you need to make sure you remove all those back plates before installing and then it pops into place. You can see it's a chunky beast. It goes all the way across the front, nearly covering some of those front fans, which is pretty nuts. And this is the standard installation, but I'm going to show you a much nicer uh, optional bracket you can use for vertical mounting in a minute. So if you've got a particularly nice looking GPU, that might be worth considering doing. So re-secure all the screws that we took out for those plates, and then we use that 600 watt power connector that I showed you earlier on. So this is that new ATX 3.0 generation of cable, and it's a single thick cable. It's a bit of a fat boy, but it looks nicer than the standard sort of adapter that you usually get with these GPUs, which have three power connections on them. And you can see the little clip here that has the multiple pins and then the little pins on top of that and again this you need to make sure the cable is connected and secured well here one of the biggest problems people have been having with this is not securing that cable properly which can then lead to problems so then nzxt has also sent this vertical gpu mounting kit which is actually really nice and really straightforward to use it basically takes up all of the pcie slots on the case though so you will need to make sure all of those are empty but it has a pcie gen 4 riser cable that runs from the back of this and plugs into the same spot that you plugged a graphics card into and then it's secured down into place. So for this process obviously you need to remove that GPU. So if you bought this afterwards, I'm going to show you the process for that now, but essentially we just need to take that graphics card back out and remove it temporarily. And then obviously I'm going to take out all of the trays at the back. So all those little covers that cover over the back because this thing takes up all of those spots. So the way it works is it basically plugs in with this cable into that top slot on your PCIe X16 slot. That's the fastest one that you want to use anyway, no matter how you're installing your graphics card. And then it slots into place at the rear and then it's screwed down and your GPU then sits in that and is secured to the bracket. You're actually meant to install the GPU into this bracket before you install it in the case, but this is how it will work. That's just the logic for it. So you can see the process for installing it now. So you install your graphics card so it's down and clips into that, obviously pushing that PCIe X16 connection into that connector on the bottom of the vertical mounting bracket and making sure that the GPU is nice and secure at the rear. It has obviously multiple screws to hold it down into that. So you'd use those screws to secure the back of the graphics card to the vertical mount to make sure it's nice and secure, but it is quite heavy, it's front heavy. So the thing will fall over. So you need to hold on to it while you're doing it. But this is the sort of top down view that you'd get from it. You can see, obviously we've got that riser cable that runs to the rear and you can plug in your power as well. This gives you potential to hide some of that power cable away, depending on your setup and how you're running it and the GPU. But then there's the sort of finished product of it mounted. So the graphics card's now mounted onto that tray. And then the tray just needs to be put into the case and secured in place. So that gives you a nicer view of your GPU, I think. And it's also set back quite well from the glass panel on the side, so it shouldn't overheat and it will still run nice as well. So what we're doing here is we're running that PCIe connection. So the ribbon cable from the rear plugs in and then we're just securing it into place there. Obviously, we've got cool air from below being pulled by those 140 mil fans up and towards the GPU. And then the GPU is going to be pulling air through it and exhausting out of the rear of it as well. So you should still get some good cooling out of that. 
and it just looks a lot better. So you have some screws included in here, which you then use to secure that bracket down. And then we use the 600 watt power supply cable that I showed you a minute ago to push it into the top now rather than into the side. Same sort of mounting location, but obviously it's now poking out the top of <laughs> GPU. So it does have a bit of a loop effect on it. But you have to be really careful not to tension that cable. So don't pull it at angles that will make pressure on it because it could potentially lead to problems. And then we have the finished product. So you can now see what the case looks like when it's finished. And we could admire our build and then go about the process of installing Windows if you haven't got it on a drive already. Obviously, you need to create a bootable media, boot into Windows, install that on your drive, and then download NZXT's CAM software. This enables you to then go through these various different fan profiles that I'm showing you with various different RGB lighting settings. And you can also obviously change the settings on the pump head as well. So you can set that up to show you both GPU and CPU temperatures, GIFs and other things, as well as readouts and various things. But you can also obviously change the RGB on both sides of those fans. There's a lot of flexibility in terms of various different RGB settings. You can also change those fans individually. So you'll see me doing some of that. If you go into the software, you can tweak those fans on an individual basis, or you can do the entire thing. So you can do all the fans at once, or you can go into single fans individually. And there's actually a lot more different profiles to choose from when you're doing it individually. So there's a lot more different schemes, color schemes to choose from. But you can see quite a few different RGB setups there. So hopefully this has been a nice, long, in-depth guide into how to build an NZXT case using these NZXT parts and the final view that you've got. And I hope that you've made it all the way to the end here. If you have, please like, comment and subscribe to let me know that you appreciated it and to please the YouTube algorithm gods and just help me out. Don't forget to check out the links in the description and the other information on both the specs of the case and all the other videos that I mentioned that will be useful if you found any of this difficult or you need to more information for example, on the Kraken mounting and the fan orientation. And enjoy. It's a wonderful looking case. Really good airflow, good looks, and a really nice setup. Thanks for watching. You've made it right to the end of the video, you brilliant legend you. If you've enjoyed it, click that subscribe button, give me a thumbs up, and drop me a comment down below if you've got any questions. If you really enjoyed it, consider joining the channel and see the benefits of doing so. Check out these other videos. You might well find them interesting or useful. And most importantly, have a great life.